I would like to introduce our participants or presenters really today. Uh, we have Stacy Gautier. Am I saying your last name right? Yeah, that's good. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. <laughs> All right. Uh, Stacy is the executive director of uh, the Renaissance Charter School Network. And then we also have Meredith Hinshaw, who is in charge of uh, Ren Sizzle, among other things. What else, <laughs> Meredith? <laughs> um, I oversee the communications and development efforts of our of our two school network. Um, Perfect. And, and for the for those of you who uh, are wondering what I'm even talking about when I say Ren Sizzle, that is what you're here for. You'll hear all about it in just a moment. Um, and uh, that network is in Queens, New York. And then we also have John Clements and Marianne Moran, who are co-principals of Nip Nipmuc High School, and that is in the Menden Upton Regional School District in Massachusetts. Hi, everyone. Great to be here with you this afternoon. Hey there, Marianne. Hey, John. Hi. Hi. All right. So uh, let's see. What is everybody else seeing on their screen? Are you seeing the presentation? I am seeing all of us. Okay. Uh, okay. Oh, it just went from pause now. Sorry. Holy cow. All right. Sorry, no, that was me. My screen changed, but I see why. All right, so um, just to orient us today, uh, we are talking about authentic student-driven learning experiences. And to level set at GOA, um, we work from the premise that learning starts with an interest and those experiences uh, provide an opportunity to explore those interests and demonstrate or apply learning. So would you, Stacy, Meredith, Marianne, or John, add anything to that? I would just jump in to say that I love the idea that it begins with the learner and that it's learner driven and that there are many different ways to take the learning experiences because we have so many different types and kinds of students in front of us. And I'm excited to learn a little bit more about Ren Sizzle, which does that so well, and share a little bit about Inspired Learning Days and how we approach that work at NITMUC. Right. And I think I would just add that, um, you know, when we think of teaching and learning, um, you know, we hear teaching and that's of course really important, but um, I think what you're gonna hear is that um, both of our programs really have a student center and a student voice um, in, in the learning that takes place. So hopefully we'll convey that to you, but there are teachers uh, voices too. Thank you very much. Um... And so before we dive into the presentations, could each of you just tell us a little bit about the origin story for Ren Sizzle and Inspired Learning Days? Sure, so I could start. Um, so just by way of history, Renaissance is a school that's been around for 30 years, our original school. So we've been doing some of this work for a long time. Um, and we did not start with a Ren Zizzle program right out of the gate. We actually had a week where um, we were trying to figure out how to balance some stuff with kids, honestly. And we had a Camp Broadway week. And um, the Camp Broadway week was really successful. But then all the other kids said, gee, why did they get a week of doing something they really wanted to do? And, and we didn't. And we thought, oh, wow, the light bulb went off. Um, why Why not? Why not have everybody have a week of something they really want to explore? And I will say we have to credit our um, our students with the term Renzizzle, in case you're wondering where that came from. Um, the kids said, well, we're Renaissance and the program sizzles, so we should call it Renzizzle. And we're like, okay, I mean, we just, um, and that's where the name Renzizzle came from. I also want to say a shout out. We did do a deep dive into some of the work of Joseph Renzulli. So while this is not a Renzulli authorized program, I want to be careful. It's on a recording. Um, we did look at the work about you know passion driven learning and student dri driven learning. So um, and have taken that into account in, in the development of our program. That's amazing. I love that, and I love how the kids came up with the with the name of it uh, and it started with a pilot and a desire. Um, John, Marianne, do you have an origin story that you could share? Yeah, I mean, I can start. We um, it goes back to probably 2015 when we had our first 
conference for students. So back back in the day, we called it 21st Century Learning Conferences. And at the time in Massachusetts, we had 21st Century Skills that we were really kind of tapping into and in trying to get educators to connect with students more. And so um, we have our traditional curriculum. And in 2015, it was like, how do we pair the traditional curriculum with these skills? And so we kind of build ourselves on a lot of what ifs around here. So we came up with the what if we just stopped traditional school for, and at that time it was a half day um, and did something different, totally connected to the 21st century learning expectations that we had. So it started there. Um, we are on our 15th one that will happen on February 6th of this year. Um, and it went from a half day just at the high school and now it's district wide. Um, it happens twice a year for full days district wide. So that's pretty exciting. I'm also hearing that trajectory of starting smaller and it just keeps growing, I think, on both campuses. That's great. All right. Uh, well, let's get started uh, with the presentations. So uh, we will begin with Renaissance, uh, and that's Stacy and Meredith, and we're talking Ren Sizzle. Take it away. Sure. So thanks. It's really great to be here, um, and it's really great to be part of the GOA community. Really excited about it. And, um, see our participation in this community is another extension of student-driven learning, which is something we're really committed to. Um, although sometimes I will say, and for those of you out there, um, you know, so we're sometimes pushing against, um, you know, the, the, the current, right? Because we have certain demands for our kids, um, you know, testing and, and, and those things. But what I will say is having been around for a very long time, when our students come back to us and they do, um, what do they talk about? Yeah, sure, they talk about they like the class or whatever, but they talk about programs like Renzizzle. I remember my Renzizzle week when I did X or Y or Z. These are the things that really inspire kids and make them want to be lifelong learners, which is um, part of our mission. So up here, you do see our mission. We, we want them to be young leaders, and we think young leaders um, should be lifelong learners who are excited, who can also understand that you can pursue different passions. You might have a real big interest in architecture. Um, you don't have to be an architect, have an interest in, in architecture. Um, a little bit about our campus. We are um, urban schools as Meredith um, and I will talk a little bit more about. So we are in Queens, New York City um, in populations that have a high percentage of students who um, are living in poverty and also um, a high percentage of students who are students with disabilities and English language learners. And I wanna point that out just to say that, um, you know, this program is not just for students who we say are academically at the high end or, um, you know, it, it, all students can benefit from this type of learning. So that's just a little bit about who we are. We are at our main campus. Um, we have students pre-K to 12. We are fully expanded out at our second school, which is newer. Um, we have grades K to four and nine and are planning to expand to K to 12 over the next few years. Meredith, anything you want to add about that I missed about talking about our school? I mean, other than the uh, we adore. Um, that's my that would be my main thing, um, but you you captured it pretty, pretty well. Krista, anything you wanted me to add? Okay, well, you did talk about it. So um, you you were talking about what is Renzizzle. I'll start, but I'll probably turn it over to um, Meredith. Yes, all students do participate in it. It is a week-long program where classes are um, suspended, traditional classes are suspended. Um, in the lower grades, it's a little shorter. In the lower grades, it's three days. So we do work them up to a week. Um, it's mixed ages which is always one of those things that people in the beginning are like, what, I don't know these students? Right, you don't know the students because the idea is they're coming together based on interest. Uh, and, and it is really exciting. Now we do, you know, full disclosure, depending on the topic, um, sometimes we'll say this is a high school only program. Sometimes it's a middle school, high school program, um, but, but it is really inquiry based and it's about student interest. We want the students to be part of a group that they want to be in, um, not, not pushed into a group because all the sixth graders are in are in that group. Meredith, want to add anything to Renzizzle? I'm sure you have a lot to say. 
I do. I I think that it's um, really helpful to get some stats behind the scope and sweep of rin sizzle. Um, and I think this is something that student really, really, um, one of the things that students love about it is that it is a full court press. Every teacher in the middle and high school for rin sizzle is involved. School counselors are involved. Our administrative staff get involved. Every single person, every student, and for us, that's 440 students in the in Ren One, um, 44 teachers, 67 field trips. It's you know, it's it's a big, the the scope and scale of it is one of the things that really I think fires up our student base and the fact that they get to um, not only say the things they want to do, but very loudly say the things they don't want to do. It gives them a chance to have strong opinions and voice it, and they're actually being heard. Um, and I think that's really one of the great pockets, of, one of the side benefits of Rin Sizzle. I mean, I would add that it's also about um, experiential learning. And so we see New York City, but more than New York City, because actually our groups have traveled to, um, you know, upstate New York and to New Jersey and to Connecticut all over the place, um, that we want them to get out and see the surrounding area as a learning lab. So most groups are out for a large amount of time. And I mean, you know, we, one quick example, but it's a one that's an easy example is, oh, we have a geography um, Renzizzle and they go to see the Sterling Mines in New Jersey. They go to Central Park to see um, the glaciers and how the glaciers are formed. But then they go to Bear Mountain to see the other side of the glacier. And they're like, wait a minute, this is the same glacier. Um, and, and it's really, really exciting to just, see the students get that aha moment um, being outside of the building. Um, we do take regular trips like most schools do, but again, this is really intensive around the topic um, and, and driven by what the kids wanna learn about in terms of the specific topic they're involved in. Well, we love this slide. This is a great slide. Um, so again, it's really true. Um, students have passions. Um, I know there's going to be a link that will show you the variety of groups that we have um, from everything from creating hip hop music um, to food. It's amazing how, how much passion there is around food um, <laughs> to science. Um, and, and every year we're looking at, at something new or things that we believe that um, you know, the kids are want because they're surveyed and they're telling us and we do try to deliver it. The other thing that we think is really wonderful about this is that the students get to see the teachers in the school in a different light. They see them as learners because maybe um, your math teacher is running a program on Korean culture um, in, in New York, which is actually what <laughs> what, he, what happened. Um, you know, so they, they see that we're multidimensional as people and that they could be multidimensional too. Um, and I think that that really translates into um, building relationships, which of course, I mean, that's another piece of this, right? It's a benefit, it's student voice, it's student passion, it's engagement, but it's also building relationships with teachers. Um, and as a K to 12 school, um, you might see these people over and over again, and every year you're gonna be involved in a Ren Zizzle. Um, probably with different people, but maybe not, because you're gonna go with the topic and the teachers don't keep the same topic necessarily. Um, we want teachers to also uh, be excited about this learning because that excitement will translate into student excitement as well. Meredith, what else? <laughs> Could you- uh, well, I wanna focus just for a second on- Yes, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, um, could you tell us a little bit about um, maybe specific ways that kids have been, been impacted. Um, and then I'm also thinking from the adult side, because I would imagine that uh, there was a shift that had to happen with your teachers. So I guess um, I'm wondering for both students and teachers in impact. It sounds like maybe we're speaking a little bit to the challenges of, of bringing passion to the table amidst the, the, the day to day kind of, um, rigors that everyone is engaged with. Um, I mean, I, you know, it's a, it's a big question. I guess one thing that I would say is that um, 
teachers have an opportunity to bring their passions to the table as well. And I think that's something that has really helped grease the wheel, so to speak, for um, for making the week something that is memorable for them as well. Um, the students get excited, the teachers get excited in return, and that does um, make the process a lot, um, just a lot more amenable to everyone. I mean, I could talk a little though about the challenges um, because we've been doing this for a long time. Um, I was in a, a principal leadership program and we decided to look at Renzizel as our problem of practice. And we came into it, this is in the early years, because we were really struggling. We were struggling to get student engagement. We were struggling to figure out what actually to do. Can we really keep these kids occupied for a week with, with you know, one or two teachers and you know what's going on here? And we really came in with the understanding that there were some student issues. Um, when in fact, when we really did a deep dive with um, some fantastic professors from Teachers College who were part of our leadership program, we really learned it was more of an adult issue. And I don't say that in a negative way. I say it just to say, um, we really needed to get teacher buy-in. Teachers had a lot of concerns. Am I able to drive this passion? What if I'm doing a group that I don't have enough expertise about? What does that look like? Um, and that's where we made the groups become more inquiry-based. The teachers do not necessarily have to be an expert in their own right. They can be, um, and sometimes they are because they're passionate, but we will also bring in, um, this year it was brand new, we brought in the Center for Architecture. We don't have anybody who, who's an architect on staff. And we had teachers who were like, I'm interested in learning that too. And they were learning along with the students. Um, teachers were also worried about, you know, just resources and what did they need to, to make this work? And, and those were things I wanna say, those were easy fixes, um, but, but it really was about getting the adults on board with, with doing this and getting the adults also um, feeling comfortable with working with kids that they that weren't their students because we know how much, um, you know, our teachers take a lot of time to develop relationship with their students and all of a sudden, boom, it's Monday morning, you know, it's not quite that way, Maris can talk to you. They have opportunities before the week to get together and to meet. So we don't, you know, completely, there's once the group is formed, they meet with their teacher, they start to plan together what they want to see. There are interactions. Um, so, so yeah, there's a lot of community building that has to happen to make it successful. But most times we find that people come out of the week actually really um, just really charged up and excited about the learning and excited about seeing the students so excited about it. So Meredith, I'll, I'll, I'll turn some of the logistics. Meredith, just so you know, it is a lot of work. I think we, we said um, Meredith is now the, the second person, the first person who started coordinating this as retired, not because of Renzizel, though. I always joke about that. She <laughs> loves it. If you still on our board of trustees, she absolutely loves it. Um, but you do need somebody, if you want to undertake this, to manage a lot of the logistics of it um, because they're just, whether it's booking trips or getting organizations involved, um, transportation in our case, um, charter buses, regular buses. Um, but even before that, there's all the different things that have to happen to get the group set up. Um, and Meredith is that point person who who pulls it all together with the teachers. So, <laughs> well, so, <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say, I mean, a big challenge is infrastructure. And that, that connects to the faculty as well. You're looking at when, when our lunch period is going to be, how are we getting bus transportation? Um, you know, all of the little bits that really are like running a micro school for a week because you have to address all the things that you have to address on a daily basis, it, you know, getting in on time, getting the kids out on time. Um, but I think just to speak, uh, you know, with the teaching and learning aspect and, and to follow up on the challenges of, of, um, you know, adult buy-in, we've been, I think, in the last couple of years, um, attentive to the needs of our faculty and, and hearing what they have what they want in order to make Rin Sizzle more successful for them. And instead of feeling like, oh, it's this thing, everything stops, and then I have to pivot and do this whole other, you know, unit that, that, that is adjacent to the things that I'm teaching, and, you know, my, my, the, 
everything I have to do in my day to day, um, we created more spaces for them to to talk openly, to have kind of a critical friends group. Um, and so that's where we've pivoted um, this year to starting at least with um, a reflective element with teachers. Um, we know that students get excited. Um, they're going to tell you, like I said, what they want and what they don't want. And we do things like surveys. Um, like I said, sometimes students are much, it's much easier for them to tell us what we they don't want to do. And then we sort of massage them with, with kind of questions like, well, do you like to go outside? You know, what do you, do you, are you more, of, you know, do you, do you read in your spare time? Like, what do you care about? Um, and so when we leverage that with the teachers as well, we do find this really nice. You know, Red Sizzle is being planned all year round, even though it's a week in, you know, for the middle and high school, it's a week in October for the lower group. It's a, a four day, three to four day um, week in May. Um, but we do, you know, once it gets going, um, the kids are up and out of the building. Um, they're going on trips, they're doing workshops, they're they they go on historical tours. We're incredibly um, grateful to have New York City as our laboratory. We you know we just we are we have uh, so many resources at our fingertips, and I and I do think that's one great thing that is an equity issue for our students that we don't necessarily um, you know getting out of the neighborhood and going to the Natural History Museum going and having a, a, a targeted um, study of a major park that's been converted from a, an old railway state, you know, old railway line. It's now, you know, a beautiful park in New York City. Those types of things um, are planned, you know, and the teachers are baking that into their to their design saying okay not only are we going to go to the Highline Park, we're going to talk about sustainability within that. Um, so, and that's the brainstorming. That's where we start with faculty want to do what they think their students want to do. And then we marry that up with the student choice as well. So I did see a question. So with over 400 students that participate in um, the middle and the high school program, um, and then the remaining of our students, our, our, our little ones um, participate, that, that's a little bit smaller and, and they're a little bit, um, that's another couple of hundred. So it is a lot of kids at the same time, I mean, at least for us. Um, and I will say, we, we really make sure that while they do a lot of trips and workshops, they're all tied to something. It's not just like, let's just go out of the building and go do a lot of stuff. It's like, what are we actually looking at? Why are we going to these places? We, we had one group that we called Abandoned New York. Um, so there were a lot of field trips, but Gee, you know, the students didn't know about some of these like abandoned hospitals we had and places that have been repurposed. Um, and they just didn't really understand sort of the history of, of the place that they that they live in. Um, so that was and, and we're we're actually really interested, some of the groups, um, and we're hoping to develop this more. Um, really we want them to have kind of a a, a problem to solve if they can. Now it doesn't have to be because it is about student interest and there's not always a problem to solve. But sometimes if we can make a problem to solve, and what I mean by that is we have a lot of kids that love culinary. Um, and when we do culinary, they they do learn to cook, they go to the culinary institute, they, they learn to shop. But, you know, we try to help them, you know, where could you find a problem with this? And so the kids themselves were like, well, we know some neighborhoods in New York City are food deserts. They don't have healthy food, or we know a lot of people don't want to eat certain foods, or we know that, you know, culturally people gravitate towards some things and not other things, or that people just don't have enough money for food and so they can eat healthy. And, and so the more we can incorporate kind of problem-based learning um, and, mm -hmm. and sort of marry it a little bit with our school that has a social justice lens. Um, and again, we don't force it. There are definitely some times when it's like, okay, we can't really figure out a problem with this. Um, but usually there is something they can think about and solve and, and make it a critical thinking piece. Um, and we're working on that. Um, and one of the things that we realize that's really important um, is we, we have some teachers who are you know, clearly at the very, you know, extensive end of, they're, they're totally behind this 110%, their programs are always great. And they're gonna build 
on our team of kind of experts to help other people who maybe don't always know how to craft some of this or don't know how to put something under a problem. Um, and they're going to be part of our of our team. Um, and we really hope to also get some some really uh, great upper grade kids because, um, you know, some of the kids really take Renzizzle. Um, this was the first year we gave um, a grade to Renzizzle and we were pretty liberal about it, um, but we really want it was satisfactory or unsatisfactory. It wasn't anything. Um, and it, to be honest, it did not take that much to get satisfactory, but we wanted our students to really understand how important this is to their learning. And, and sometimes, you know, with kids when they're, when there's a grade um, and, and it's like, you know, you need to participate. We need to hear your voice. It's not about right or wrong in Renzizzle. So you're not going to fail a Renzizzle class, you know, maybe you'll fail a math test, but, but how are you participating? How are you contributing? Um, you know, how are you, you know, sharing your voice? It's, it's about that. And um, I think the kids get that. And, and this year was a big year um, to do some messaging to parents as well. And I, I mean, especially coming out of the pandemic and um, especially again, we're in New York City, there's been um, a lot of fear out there about some of the rise in crime. I mean, even though you'll hear we don't have rising crime, but the perception for people is there. So we had to also talk to our parents about your kids traveling and what does that look like and how do we keep everybody safe? So there's a lot of messaging that goes on with getting Renzizzle um, really off and out there and getting all the stakeholders, students, teachers, staff, parents, guardians uh, on board with it. Well, thank you, Stacey and Mer Meredith. Um, I'm sure that we are going to circle back. And before we circle forward, um, I do want to ask Marianne and John if there is anything, having heard what you just did, um, if there is anything you want to ask or say about what you just heard, or if there are connections that you see between what you're about to share and what you just heard. Yeah, absolutely, Krista. Thank you to Stacy and Meredith. Listening, I, I've just in, in amazed and I'm feeling this synchronicity with the mission of Global Online Academy, where we have this audience group of people like-minded educators literally across the globe coming together to work on the same challenge. And it's exciting to think that while we were here in Massachusetts working on how do you answer the question of how do you create powerful, meaningful, student-driven learning experiences and put them at the center of the student, student experience, you were asking yourselves the same question and coming up with a program that worked for your school. So I just love to see the connections between the work that you did and the work that we've done, and I'm sure the work that's taken place all across the globe with our partner schools who are on the call today. Well, thank you. With that, let's get into it. Let's talk Nipmuc High School. Yeah, I'm happy to introduce our school a little bit. Again, my name is John Clements, and Marianne and I are uh, really excited to represent Nipmuc Regional. We're located in central Massachusetts, and um, we're a smaller district. We have about 2,200 students, pre-K through 12. And we serve as co-principals, which is kind of a unique model of our high school of 600 students. I've been here for 25 years at the school and 20 as an administrator. Marianne and I have been a leadership team for the past 13 and um, have reshaped our role as co-principals, partly because we're so excited about the work that's going on in our district. We're really fortunate. We lead an amazing group of teachers who are forward thinking and try new ideas. And um, I think that's sort of the DNA of our district. We're a district that's been, for the past two solid strategic plans, really been focused on student agency, deep inquiry, and authentic learning as our true north. Those are the things that guide us and drive us. And so at the a cornerstone of that work is our portrait of the learner, which you see up in front of you, recognizing that the content that's embedded in the curriculum is critically important, but just as important are the skills that students need, not only to actualize that the curriculum, but also to develop a really strong, powerful personal narrative, a story they tell themselves about themselves. Um, and so our job as educators here in this district is to kind of break down some of the past practice of school, um, keep the wonderful aspects and build new, innovative, exciting options 
that align with our vision. We're big believers, and I, may, I might mess up the quote, but it's from Ted Dintersmith. It's that small sparks of change can lead to bonfires of innovation. And we're excited to share with you today one of those sparks that's been a real, real motivator for our community. Awesome. So I'll give a little overview of Inspired Learning Days again, and then we'll dig in. I think you're going to hear a ton of parallels between what Stacey and Meredith talked about and what we're going to talk about. As they were talking, I was like, man, I was going to say that. That's the same thing that's happening. So from Massachusetts to New York, there's, there's a lot of uh, similar things that are happening. So as I mentioned, we've been doing these days since 2015. They have changed and they have morphed. And maybe someday we'll be where Stacy and Meredith are and they'll be full weeks at our school or um, learning will look more like it every single day. But there are days where we stop everything traditional about our schedule. And I think that was a, an important part to say, we're opening up the floodgates to say, what could learning look like if we take away the schedule, the standards, the grade levels, kind of all of those pieces that constrain what we're able to do on any typical school day or week or year. Um, so that was a big part of it. And then kind of the other guiding principle we looked at is how do we organize a day for students that's similar to a professional conference? Um, as educators and leaders, we often get to leave our buildings and go to professional conferences and you get to interact with people who have similar interests as you. You get to connect with professionals both in and outside of the field. Um, there's usually good food often good swag. And so we kind of set out on this mission to recreate that for students. Um, and again, like I mentioned, at first it was tied to 21st century learning expectations. 2018, our district um, developed the portrait of a learner. And so now it's tied to that, but essentially tied to the skills that we want all students to master. And some of the things that Stacey and Meredith talked about too, in terms of mixed age, interdisciplinary, right? Connected to the world beyond. There's something about food, Stacey, you keep talking about food, anything food related, and it could be high schoolers too. They flock to it. They're like, I'm going to get to cook and eat. Um, they're all over it. But really this sense of designing these authentic learning experiences. We have one coming up on February 6th. Like I said, it's our 15th one. Um, I actually have the session sitting in front of me because we were working on enrolling students today and in them. So everything from a session like unveiling video game lore, which is really a group of students coming together who are super interested in the stories behind video games um, and how they analyze games, even though all the details aren't shared. But so really digging into the idea of story to poetry out loud, where students are kind of watching and critiquing. Um, spoken poetry, and then doing some spoken poetry of their own. Um, we have a local judge coming in to do behind the bench, a ju judicial sp perspective on criminal justice. We have a Lego adventure where kids are going to get to build and be creative. We have Unleashing the Leader Within, which is really kind of leadership training um, for our athletes and other students that have interest in that. So it's a wide array. I think the uniting force is that it's based on student interests and they get to where they want to go. So it's not saying as ninth graders, you have to go here and as 10th graders, you go here. It's really opening up a menu of options. And we have anywhere from 30 to 40 sessions every time we hold it um, and students get to pick. So that's pretty exciting. Great, as you move to the next slide, as you hear Marianne talking about all those sessions, from a student perspective, it takes the idea of walking into school and going to English or math or science or social studies. And now all of a sudden they're going into a more immersive experience that's really based on their interest. Our, our offerings are often half or full days. So it gives kids the chance to really develop, um, to go deeply into the subject matter and also develop some relationships with their peers. And for us, the impact of that is that it allows us to start to sort of chip away at some of that architecture of traditional school that can hold us back from being the version of, of ourselves that we want to be. You have up in front of you um, one of our beliefs about learning. Um, we believe the community is our classroom. I think probably all of us could say that. We want our students out in our communities doing real work that has relevance to the real world. This is a playground for us to try new ways to make that happen. So inspired learning days are days where we could have students out building proteins in a local university lab. They could be at a local restaurant making empanadas. We've had students head out to um, a local state park, join up with a park ranger, hike, do some snowshoeing and do some nature journaling. 
for students who take their study of Gatsby and then travel about an hour away down to Newport. I know we have some Rhode Island folks on the call today. I head down to Newport and see some of the mansions in a Living Like Gatsby session or service. They could go work in the local community center, give back to the local school. So for us, this is a way that we can make our beliefs, the things that really drive us, come to life in new and exciting ways. And what happens is not only that belief starts to come to fruition, but we start to challenge the idea that, well, you need a bell that's going to move you from one class to the next, or that classes need to be siloed into disciplines. Everything becomes interdisciplinary. And one by one, we start not only to kind of challenge the things that hold us back, but to find solutions of new ways to move forward. So for us, this small spark, this one day, is not the answer to how we live our vision, but it is um, an attempt. And from that, it, it sparks a lot of new and, and more exciting ideas coming from our really talented teachers. Awesome. So we figured we'd give you some te technical pieces. Um, John and I are believers that um, everything will get, take as much space as you give it, right? And in education, I mean, time is, I think, one of our precious, most pressed precious resources. So as we thought about this process to develop them, we tried to make it student-focused, student-centered, but really as streamlined and um, as possible. So it didn't feel like it needed to take up half the year to plan one of these days. So we always start with school-wide brainstorming. School-wide brainstorming for us definitely has a fun factor to it. We often hold it in our lobby or in our cafeteria. Um, you see a picture on the screen in front of you. Um, we have lots of post-it notes. We often have food or treats to bring the kids there because they like to be fed. There could be a photo booth or other fun things going on, balloons. But our job is to ask students a question. And that question changes. It's all based on the same thing. So you could craft a question in many different ways. A couple of ours is if you had an hour, a half day, or a full day, what would you want to learn? So completely wide open. What is something you've always wanted to learn, but we don't teach? So getting kids kind of to think outside of the box a little there. What is one experience you wish you could have if you could choose your own adventure? So we had a choose your own adventure theme day, um, but really getting them to think kind of outside the box. Some of that came from the responses we got each time. Some of the responses of what do, what do you want to learn, but we don't teach. We got taxes. I can't even tell you how many times. Taxes, taxes, taxes. And that's great. We can incorporate taxes into our curriculum, but we wanted this sense of adventure and excitement and getting out into the community too. So that was our job to kind of push them a little bit further um, because out of that, one of the questions we'd get, we want to learn how to iron and cook. And those are important skills. And we've had had sessions around some of those, um, but we wanted the, the students to think aspirationally as well. So then we take all of those post-it notes they all get typed into a document and sorted through there. You will find repetition. So while we have 600 students in our school, there is some repetition. So we write the number of times that that session idea came up. And then that's the starting point for our faculty, which John will talk about in just a second with collaborative session building. Yeah, it's really exciting when you see what students are interested in. You can almost do a bar chart with the post-it notes when you put them up visually and, and start to get a sense of what kids are looking for. But then the question is, well, what next? We have all of these. And Marianne said it, this, this work will fill as much space as you give it. So we take the approach of collaborative session building. We have started, we started this way and we're gonna go to the next slide. You'll get a look at the tool that we use. And I think we'll share out a link also for you to take a look at the session building doc yourself. Our teachers are now skilled enough that we don't even need to spend this time in a faculty meeting, but we would take about 20 to 30 minutes of a faculty meeting and use this document where we, we helped people structure the Inspired Learning Day sessions with just a few categories. One, start with a fun title. Think of something that's exciting and that's engaging that's gonna pull someone in. From there, working with a partner, hopefully someone outside of your discipline or your department, maybe someone you don't see every day, start to think of what you want students to get out of that session. Third, pair it with a community partner. Who's around? What local business leader, community leader, partner could you bring in? And then think about what the kids will be doing, what hands-on or engaging activity. I've also been talking a lot about artifacts. What, what's the artifact of learning that students will produce? And as you can see here, we have a sample up top. So a title of a session could be instant exposure, becoming a photographer for a day. 
And then you explore the skill set of becoming a photographer, learn how to use photo editing software, and create a portfolio of images in a day. So that was a key part of it, right? Not just learning the skill, but you're creating a photo portfolio in one day and get some local photographers in in order to help out with this. The neat part about the session building is just what our friends at Renaissance were talking about, and that you can um, encourage teachers to bring in their own interests and curiosities. We are all learners. That's one of the tenets of our school. Uh, we're all learners. And so teachers are learners in the areas of fitness or social justice or knitting or genealogy or Latin cooking, whatever it may be. They come with their passions each day. And this is another opportunity to integrate their passions into the school day help students develop those passions as well. Better yet, we've also had students run their own sessions. So what, what's a student passion about that they could take that session and pair up with a faculty member and run that session together? We've, uh, you'd be amazed that when you do this in a Google Doc in a collaborative second, a setting, this Google Doc will explode quickly. Um, I took a look at some of the past session building docs and then see some great ideas. The first one was into the wild, learn the learn survival skills, and you bring in local staff from an REI and an EMS, like a great idea right off the bat. Fake it till you make it, Adobe designing. Another one was the sky's the limit, exploring safe uh, space and learning about our universe, traveling to a local planetarium. The energy in the room is palpable. Play some music while you're doing it. Watch the energy just go up and the excitement level goes up and that's critical because you don't want this to be an anxiety ridden day. You want this a day that every learner, adults and kids alike are really excited about. So John and Marianne, if I may interrupt, there's a, a question uh, and it's about how you decide what to do or focus on in those non-traditional days. You shared a little bit about collaborative session building, whether through this document or the post-its and Renaissance, you can share a little bit more as well. But you said there's an explosion of ideas. So how do you how do you choose? Yeah, so, like? so it starts with the student brainstorming, right? So our faculty take all of the student brainstorming and that's their first stop. Run through everything that the students are asking for. And we'll talk a little bit about signups and how they're based on student interest. Um, so they start there, they pair it with their own interests and then they just get creative to design sessions. So it's really up to the teachers to design the sessions that, that we're going to put forward for students. So when a teacher is designing a session, they're essentially owning that session, whether it be with a student, a community partner, another faculty member in the room. So this gets them going in that 20 minutes of the faculty meeting. And then in another week, kind of all of the ideas settle out and some come and some go and some teachers pair up or they find a different community partner or they're driving home from school and they're like, what if we could do this session? And so sometimes a single teacher will brainstorm multiple sessions and then we find someone else to tag in to be able to help with that. Um, but it's really based on what they create um, what runs and what doesn't run is based on student interest. And so once we put it out to the students, if there is no student interest, the session does not run. And we can talk a little bit about that after um, Stacy or, or Meredith chimes in to answer your question too. But yeah, I just want to say, I think we follow, it's very similar to you. Um, and so it's the same thing. We have the student brainstorming and I think we all love balloons because I know on our interest day too, the balloons go up, it's kind of, celebratory to get everybody kind of psyched about it. Um, but yeah, if there's no interest in a session, and I mean, we've had some teachers be kind of depressed because they really wanted to push a session through, um, but the kids didn't want it. Now, one thing though that I, I think we have tried to do though, and it can be pretty successful, is if a teacher really wants a session and they're really passionate, um, but, the, but the students didn't really push it, we say, well, how do you market this? Maybe you're going to get some student interest. Have you tried to build up interest? You know, maybe the kids wouldn't know about the great Gatsby and you have to go and tell them this is going to be really cool. Um, and so we do want that exchange. Um, you know, in the end of the day, the kids still are the final ones to not to sign up or not sign up. But we've seen lots of kids sign up for something after going, oh, my gosh, Teacher X was telling me this, this and this. And now I think it's kind of exciting. Um, and we think that's great because a lot of times our kids will put down things, but they also don't know what they don't know. So it is an exchange. It's about really saying, but at the end of the day, we're very similar, I think, um, to Marianne and John. If, if nobody wants it, even after we've sold it, 
then that group doesn't fly. And, um, you know, if the teacher really wants to make it happen, again, it's it's about building relationships, talking to kids. Um, sometimes we have um, integrated things um, into other. So if the teacher's leading a group, but they really want that part. It could be integrated into it, hoping to, again, spark an interest. Um, but, but it really is about giving the kids, to the extent that we can, something they want to learn. I think I got that right, Meredith. Yes, you did. I was thinking of some examples from the last year of this. And one is great. We had a film review, uh, Rin Sizzle, that didn't get a whole lot of traction on the ranking. And the the teachers who were organizing said, wait a minute, I don't understand it. You know, when I talked about this with my students at the end of last year, they were really excited. And so then he started, he, I said, well, no, the, the votes aren't there. So what are you going to do? And he went, he said, oh, I went and we, I collaborated. They want to do horror films. So we've created the, you know, we've rebranded it. We're going to focus on, I think the exorcist, the new, uh, you know, I don't like horror films, but they, they ended up making it into something even better than the idea was to start with. And that happened relatively quickly, before, you know, uh, in, in the moment. And that's where the, I think that spark like you're talking about really comes alive. We had a second group just to share really quickly that um, the teacher's really passionate about creative writing. Um, and I think the marketing of the groups is, a, it is really important that the phrase creative writing did not inspire a large number of students to, to sign up. So we, I went back to the teachers and say, oh, you know, you've designed this great week. It's so rich with opportunity, but what's the, you know, how do we get the buy-in? And so we talked about it and, uh, you know, go back to the old familiar. Maybe we could tie in some culinary activities to this. Maybe we can talk about book binding. Maybe we can get, you know, get into creative writing through these hands-on opportunities. And so I, the, that ended up being a really successful unit for those kids um, because they didn't, they, they, they got to think outside the box of something that I think they, their preconceived notions of what they were going to do were up, were changed by this integration of thinking about creative writing in a new way. I think that's a really helpful uh, set of answers to understand how these sessions get designed and that iterative process always grounded on the student response. So if there isn't traction, then what is it about it that needs to be altered and how do we engage more student voice in the definition of the session itself? It sounds like there are probably some sessions that are more popular than others. Uh, and one of the questions are, is around how you decide who, who does what. It sounds like there are some ranking that goes on in both places. Uh, and Margaret also asked a question around what is the general size of each learning group? A very practical perspective. So I yeah, think that's about, oh, 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 say, just just I mean ranking. I mean we do give our older students um, priority, generally speaking, um, because the younger students will have more time to do a group. So for a really popular group, um, we do have to rank five choices. So sometimes we have students who are coming going, oh, I got choice number four, and you know they're not as happy, and and we spend a lot of time saying there's a lot of groups. So really make sure don't put a group there that you don't want. Um, because there's also kids have a tendency, right? I want to be in the group with my friend. They find out after the fact that their buddies are in this group. And and there's some of that. Um, but I will say, I think for the most part, the, the ranking works. And the kids also know that, um, you know, they're going to also be an upper class person at some point and have a priority into groups. Um, we have looked, though, to have more than one of a group if it's really popular or something that's in a similar theme um, when the kids really want it. Um, you know, now, of course, we don't want the whole Renzizzle to be culinary Renzizzle, although, you know, who knows? But, um, you know, we we try. Um, but but the group sizes tend to be no more than, than 20, really. Right, Meredith? That's kind of where with two adults. Um, and so 20 is because we're going around, we're, we're taking trips, we're leaving, um, you know, but I will say that the other thing that happens too is that all of the different groups, you know, we learn from the prior group. Um, so next year, uh, I'm a little scared to say it, but our geography, ge our geology group is going to be extreme geology because the kids want to have some more um, extreme experiences. So they are going to do some spelunking. Um, and, and some climbing and some different things that uh, 
you know, we, we obviously, some of our groups are a little bit more active than others, but we think that's great. Um, and, you know, we spend a lot of time just thinking, how do you take it to the next level and what are the kids looking for? Yeah, I don't know if someone wants to move to the next slide too. We can talk about our other things, but signing up is a similar process. This is actually probably one of our biggest lessons learned. When we first started, we would put the sessions out with maximum capacities. We used a program called Sketch, um, where it was like the Hunger Games. Our link was released and students would like frantically click and then try and get the session that they wanted to get into. And if they were boxed out of that, then they would try another and so what was happening is that there was a lot of students not getting any of their choices um, because they would try for their first choice. And we were boxing students out by putting kind of maximums on sessions because we needed to spread them out. And so now we use a process with Google Form. We put all the sessions out. We ask students to pick their top four sessions just because we have half days too. So um, it's not really first, second, third, fourth. It, it allows the mix. And there's a science to session size a little bit in terms of you take the number of staff you have divided by the number of students. So you need to have about, you know, 15 to one ratio when you're starting to look at some of these things. But we don't say how many can be in either session to start. We really build it from the ground up. So we have a session going to Boston. Um, students love to be out of the school. They do not want to sit in a seat in the classroom. I will tell you that or something active hands on in the school. Um, they're going to Boston to a museum to explore drones and AI. Um, and so that session, I think we had a we had planned for two teachers to take a group of 50 students. We had 138 students interested in that. We're not quite there, but we have nearly 100 headed out to go there. So we try and honor the first choices because they're speaking, they're telling us what they want. This is a student focused day. And so the more we can change. So that means someone else's session didn't have many. So we have sessions that didn't get interest that aren't running. So now those teachers can help out in the sessions where there is more interest. So it requires flexibility on the part of staff, but it really um, has been working quite well for the things that we've been doing. We know we're coming right up against the deadline. Just the last couple of things we wanted to share here were um, the idea of messaging and the communication for this. We just encourage you to publish, publish frequently, take the time to create a Canva graphic, build a website, share it, make it transparent. And then along with publishing, make sure that it's not just the details of the day. Make sure you're connecting it to your vision. This is a chance for your community to see that the aspirational work you're doing connects directly to the best version of yourselves. And that's important to repeat and echo and share as frequently as possible. And the last piece is about capturing the impact, Marianne. Great, and so this is an opportunity, like we said, to explore a portrait of a learner's skills, but um, reflection is a big part of the learning. So we always take time at the end of the day or the next day, depending upon how busy the day looks, where students pause, look at their artifacts of learning and reflect on the portrait of the learner skills that they develop. Sometimes that's video reflection, sometimes that's written reflection, sometimes it's group activities in their advisory to reflect on it, but not just having the day happen, but like John said, having the day happen and connecting it to the greater vision, helping students reflect on the skills that they learned over the course of the day. So we always make time. And I know um, Stacey Merritt has said this too, reflection is a big part of you know their week as well. That's inspired learning days in a quick, in a nutshell, very quickly. Krista, I believe you're on mute. Thank you. Um, yeah, thank you very much for, it's a lot of information, right? It's a lot of information. And so what I would encourage folks to do is scroll through that chat, click those links in terms of the communication that John was talking about and investing in a Canva graphic and you know, a website and writing and all of that. A lot of it is actually captured in some of the links that uh, that are in the chat. So I encourage you to look at those. Um, in the last, you know, two minutes that we have, folk, one minute. Ah, um, if there's one last thing that you feel like you need to just put out there, what might that be? And I'll start with the Renaissance team. Is there one last thought or a thing you want to underscore? 
I think one last thought is that it's really about what works for your community. So um, whether it's a day, whether it's a week, whether it's, um, you know, whether it ends in, in a presentation, we've had several of our Ren Sizzles end where they present to each other. We've since changed that a little bit. Um, we have presentations to each other, but that's not something they have to do. Sometimes they're actually presenting to lower grade students um, or other people. And we're actually thinking about presenting out. Um, I'm inspired by learning about the Inspired Learning Days because I'd actually like to add that even though we have a week. Um, so it makes me think it has to be something that works really um, for your community. As long as there's student voice in it, um, it's gonna be successful. Thank you. And from the Nipmuc regional team. Thanks. I would just say, don't don't uh, decide it needs to be perfect. We've had 15 of these and all 15 have been different because we respond to feedback, we change, revise, we're in a constant loop of growth and development. So lean into the design process with this one. Yeah, and I was just gonna say, go back and ask what if, right? So everyone that's listening in, go back to your team, talk about what you heard and be like, what if we did this? Just change one thing, one little thing, start small, um, big things can come from it. I love what if, Ren Sizzle and Inspired Learning Days. Um, that's wonderful. We are going to send out uh, a video to this uh, session today with all the resources as well. So folks, if you did not get to get all the uh, things from the chat, you don't have to be feverish about it. We will get them to you. And I just want to take a moment to thank Stacy and Meredith and Marianne and John for spending time with us today and being so generous. Pleasure. Thank, thank you so much. And thank you for having us. Thank you. Thank you so much. It was wonderful.